We'll go to Hebrews chapter 13. All right. Father, we love you, and we love your word, and we ask for open hearts and open minds right now. Holy Spirit, come. We can't understand this without you, and we want to understand. We want to live. We want to have life and blessing, and we need to obey you and walk in your ways. We need the gift of faith to, to receive it. And I ask for the grace of God, Lord, on my, my, my mind, my heart, right now, to bring your word so we hear your voice and not mine. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to um, pick up today at, at verse 1. I'll read verse 1 through 3 of chapter 13. And then I'm going to read verse 15 and 16. And I'll show you in a little bit uh, why. Now, let me just say this before I start. I'm going to have to take you through, you've got, you look at your notes, please do not run for the door. Um, I, I don't go extraordinary long at all. It's a normal length, which is either extraordinarily long compared to a lot of people, but it's normal for me. Uh, so I've written a lot of it out, so I can simply read it through, and if you don't pick it up, you can go right back and read it again. Uh, but I've got to explain to you some very Jewish things. And I'm going to take and, un and, and unfold some, some Jewish things, and then out of that you'll see a, a, a beautiful principle that applies to us and what he's saying. But to understand what he's saying, I've got to do a little bit of explaining and a little bit of homework here. This is, this is a very, very Jewish passage. It's a beautiful one, but without some insight, we won't know what we've heard. So here we go. Uh, chapter 13, I'll read the first three, and then I'll go down to 15, 16. He says, let the love of the brethren continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember the prisoners as though in prison with them, and those who are ill-treated, since you yourselves also are in the body. And then I stop. I, we actually did that verse, verse 4, last week, if you recall, down to verse 15. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips. Now, mine says, for reasons known only to someone, and not me, that give thanks to his name. The word has nothing to do with giving thanks. It means, it means confess, and it's the only thing it does mean, and why they did that, I don't know. Anyway, it is the fruit of lips that confess his name. Now, you can see the meaning of that. And do not neglect doing good. I'll tell you what that means in a minute. And sharing, I'll tell you what that means. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. All right, here we are. Every person who's poor isn't poor for the same reason. Some are innocent victims of circumstance, while others stubbornly brought themselves to that condition. You may have noticed. So how we help has to vary as well. Just giving money to a person or organization in some cases will only make the problem worse. That's because giving to the poor takes real skill. Yet this does not exempt those of us without such skills from giving. It means we need to learn how to give from those who do. And in some cases, let others do the giving for us. Yes, God wants each of us to be generous. But generosity alone isn't enough. We must also be wise. We should never simply give money away saying to ourselves, well... I've done my part, so whatever happens with that money is of no concern to me. That's not true. We're called to be stewards, not merely givers. We must never waste precious resources that, if given wisely, would truly further God's kingdom. In the pastoral remarks at the end of his letter, the author of Hebrews tells his readers that God wants believers to thank him for our salvation by giving generously to people in need. He compares such giving to the thank offerings the people of Israel presented at the temple. He encourages us to give to the poor and care for persecuted believers like they were members of our own family. I'll show you where I get that. Now back to the text. I'll follow, verse. you can follow with your eye, verse 1. The first area he addresses is brotherly love. Mine says, let the love of the brethren. Do you know what the Greek word is there? 
Philadelphia, yes. He says, let Philadelphia remain, is what he says. And, and anybody who's from Philadelphia is glad to hear that. <clears throat> he says, let it remain, meaning don't allow your practical care of one another to erode. In particular, verse 2, one area of brotherly love which was being forgotten was hospitality. Now, let me insert something here. The early church, from the very beginning, had people being thrown out of their families, ostracized, uh, persecuted for their faith in Christ. You see it right off in the book of Acts. And you see the early church caring for each other, uh, bringing people into their homes. Uh, you see people selling pieces of property and giving it to the apostles. You see the care of the poor. And in this case, it wasn't, it wasn't simply primarily the care of, of generic poor. It was care, caring for those who were homeless, who were abandoned, who were persecuted for their faith in Christ. They were, they were being family to each other. And what he's saying is, over the course of years, that practice is declining. But they're still being persecuted. And there's kind of a weariness with caring for others, apparently, that's been building up. This is written, in my opinion, I think, right, it's about 68 A.D. Uh, I think Jesus was crucified in 32 A.D. And so you, you can see there's been all of these years that have passed, and that, that, that willingness to care and to give and to serve each other is eroding. So he says, let it remain. It needs to come back. In particular, the area of hospitality, he says. The Greek word means love of strangers, which would certainly include welcoming traveling apostles and evangelists into their homes, since, since few inns were available in ancient times. But in light of the persecution many were experiencing, the strangers he was encouraging them to welcome must have also included homeless believers. Many had been ostracized from their families or had lost their homes and property. In the early years following Pentecost, there had been a strong sense of responsibility to care for one another, but apparently the practice of koinonia had begun to wane. As a way of motivating his readers to restore this practice, the author reminds them that some have entertained angels without knowing it, referring most likely to the unexpected arrival of the Lord and two angels at Abraham's tent in Hebron and the late and later of the angel's encounter with Lot in Sodom. Do you remember those events? All of a sudden, Yahweh and two angels show up and have dinner with Abraham and Sarah. And what he's saying is God can show up with surprise encounters in which he's there and he tests your heart. Amen. Yeah. Why don't we turn off our cell phones? I didn't think to say that, but, or at least put them on vibrate, all right? Uh, I, I, we had one the, uh, last week. It sounded like a bird, like, connect, like a little chirping bird, and I'd just been talking about mourning, and it was something like, da, 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 tilly, you know, and I always want a joke, and I have to control myself every time one of those goes off, so. All right, verse 3. Next, the author reminds his readers to continually remind yourselves of the prisoners by thinking of themselves as having been bound with them. In other words, when a fellow believer is arrested, we should be as concerned as if we were in jail with them. He also describes these prisoners as the ones being evilly treated, referring to the tortures and deprivations which occurred in such jails. Believers who still had their liberty should remember that they too were in the body and might someday suffer the same hardships. With this in mind, they ought to care for their imprisoned brothers and sisters just as they would wish to be cared for if they were the ones in prison. Such care would certainly include visiting them bringing, and bringing blankets, food, clean clothes, and of course, prayer. Now, let your eye go down. We're going to verse 15. You say, how does this relate? You'll, you'll see in just a moment how these passages relate to each other. How should believers respond to the fact that God sent his son to be our ultimate sin offering? Now, looking at your text, you, you see verses 10 through 13? I can't be too difficult, right? You're with me? 
Let me tell you what he's describing there. He is describing there a sin offering, a particular kind of offering, and in particular, the sin offering that was given on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which was made for the entire nation of Israel, in which there is a bull which is sacrificed, and then the blood of the bull is taken all the way in to the Holy of Holies. There the high priest will have this bowl, and he dips and he sprinkles. It's like this. Seven times he sprinkles the blood on the, on, the, on the mercy seat, the gold plate on top of the Ark of the Covenant. Seven times he sprinkles the blood on the ground before it. He's appealing for mercy right before the Lord. But that day, that bull's body is not eaten as, as other sin, sin offerings would be done. That bull will be taken out and burned entirely in a holy place. It's symbolic of Christ. It's a prophetic event. He will go on to say, just as the sacrifice was taken outside the gate, so our Lord Jesus was crucified outside the gate. Let us go out and bear his reproach. Let's stand with him as our sin, sin offering. Now what I want, okay, you got sin offering? That's what he's just said in verse 10 through 13, talking to Jews. He said, Christ is our sin offering. He's our Yom Kippur. And then he says in verse 15, this. The term, <clears throat> pardon me, the author says we should thank him by presenting peace offerings. The term he uses here, which means it's translated sacrifice of praise, or thanks, is used also in Leviticus chapter 7, verse 12, where it describes a peace offering presented to give thanks to God. Peace offerings were intended to express thanks for some saving act which God had performed, or to make a vow or express fellowship with God by being his guest at a symbolic meal with him. Go back and look at chapter 7 of Leviticus. I told you I have to explain some Jewish things here to you. For you to understand what he's saying. But you'll love it when you see it. Now, on my page, I've got verse 24 through 30 of chapter 6. So you need to see that first. Those verses are describing the sin offering. In particular, the sin offerings where the blood is taken in before God. And it says you will not eat the body of that sacrifice, but it will be burned in a holy place. All right, so the sin offering's been given. Ten verses later, he, sa he uses, listen, the exact same words in the Greek, because there's a Greek translation of the Old Testament, the exact same words that the author of Hebrews uses that you have translated sacrifice of praise. And it's referring to a peace offering. So he says, here's the deal, he says, for the great sin offering which Christ has made us, here's how you say thanks to God with your peace offerings. Now let me tell you what a peace offering is. A peace offering isn't like other sacrifices. Other sacrifices, you'd lay your hands on the animal, you'd confess your sins, you'd impart your sin to, the, to this poor beast. You'd cut its throat, it would die, you'd, you'd, the blood would go out before the Lord, appealing, this animal's life for mine. Have mercy. But a peace offering isn't that. Yes, the blood was applied to the altar, but the peace offering was by and large a fellowship meal where because you are forgiven, because God does love you, you have a, basically a meal with him. Now, don't go there where you think, oh, God's eating with us. No, God's not eating going, oh, that's good stuff. Uh, that's another religion all together. But God is with you as you eat. Have you, have you noticed, for example, when uh, Solomon dedicated the temple, uh, they sacrificed, what was it? I don't know, 150,000 oxen or something like that. And you think, that is disgusting. All those poor animals. <coughs> you know, what's the deal here? It was a national barbecue. <laughs> it was. Yes, they poured the, they, they put blood out before, but then they all sat down and they ate the things. And you're feeding an entire nation. It was a national barbecue. They all ate together in God's presence. A peace offering is a fellowship time with God. 
And it's a way we give thanks to him or make vows to him. So the author of Hebrews, talking to these Jews, saying, all right, Christ is your Yom Kippur. How do you bring your peace offering to God for the great sacrifice he's made for you? And he will tell us he wants three sacrifices in thanks. Let's see. The author does not want his readers to literally go to the temple. No, no, don't go to the temple and offer a, a ram. They're present, and they're present an offering. Rather, he wants them to thank God by, and now are we, pardon me, back in, go back to Hebrews 13. He says he wants us to, he wants us to thank God by, first of all, continuing to confess his son's name. He says, a sacrifice of praise, a thank offering to God that is the fruit of lips that confess his name. He says, you want to thank God for your salvation? Keep confessing Christ. And what was the issue for Israel, for these Jewish believers? Was that they were beginning to deny Christ. He said, if you want to thank the Lord for your salvation, keep Speaking his name, keep confessing him. Do not deny your Lord. Secondly, in verses 15, he will give two more sacrifices. And he, and he says, he wants, God, the Lord wants from us to be financially generous by giving to the poor in general. That's the term there. Do not neglect doing good. I know that sounds like a huge, vaporous term, doing good, but it means something specific. I'll show you. Look at Mark 14, verse 7. Here is, the, uh, in, 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 one of, in verse 7 is the exact same word, again, the exact same term, do good, and this is what it means. The woman has brought the alabaster vial of perfume, has broken the neck of it, and poured out what is worth one entire year's wages. What do you make a year? That's how much value that woman just poured out in oil on Jesus. It says it's 300 denarii. A denarii is a, is a working man's day's wage. 300 virtually, a year's worth of salary. So watch what happens. It says, some, verse 4, were indignant, remarking to one another, why has this perfume been wasted? By the way, who's the sum? Judas, he kept the purse and he's been pilfering. But you'll notice that they had a purse and they had a practice of giving to the poor, even Jesus with his disciples. For this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii and the money given to the poor, and they were scolding her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you bother her? She's done a good deed to me. For you always have the poor with you. And whenever you wish, you can what? Do good, exact same words, to them. But you do not always have me. What did he mean by do good? Come on. Give to the poor. Right. So the author of Hebrews says, one of the ways God wants you to thank him for your salvation is to care for the poor. Give to the poor. And then he goes on. Let's go back to Hebrews. See, I've got to unpack this thing over the... We don't, we don't know what we're seeing. So we get into it, it, make, it starts making beautiful, beautiful sense. He says, you are to do good and sharing. Now the word he, he translates sharing, what's that? Koinonia. Say koinonia. He says, that means he wants us not only to do good to the, to the poor in general, but to contribute to the support of impoverished believers. The word koinonia means to have in common like a family. And the early church took care of each other. If someone was suddenly thrown out of their homes, if they were hungry, if they were, if they were in jail, you took care of them in practical terms, like your own flesh and blood. You went and you brought them into your house. You took blankets and food. You cared for each other. It's an, we often hear the word koinonia used for like a coffee gathering you know, or something. Well, whatever. But it doesn't mean that. It, it was a technical term. They were using it very deliberately in the early church. Koinonia meant you took care of each other. Though you weren't related by blood as if you were. They're your family. 
They're your brothers and sisters. They're eternal family to you. And you take care of them like your own. So, for the great peace offering, pardon me, for the great sin offering which Christ has made us, we bring him peace offerings of thanks. What are they? We confess him with our lips. We care for the poor. And we care for each other like brothers and sisters when we're in need. Now I'll get to the sermon. <laughs> there are numerous reasons why people are poor. But for our discussion, many would fall into one of three categories. Believers persecuted for their faith. We've seen that. People who have been helplessly impoverished by circumstances over which they had no control. Family, religion, culture, government, weather, illness. Do you know people like that? Are you one of those where it's no fault of your own? You didn't do anything. But through, through a, a weather event, through illness, through family, people, people in so much of the world can be trapped into poverty they've had, they have no responsibility for. They're just stuck in it. In the United States, at least up till lately, m most of the poverty, the estimates are like 85% of the poverty in the United States, the real poverty, has to do with people who have exhausted the goodwill of their families through alcohol, drugs, and even mental illness. People who are antisocial, who've broken down. Now, they deserve care, and I'm going to say something about that. But you take the poor in the United States, and then you take the poor in many of the other parts of the world, and there's a profound difference. Many of the other parts of the world, people are poor because there's, there, there are, there's no food, there's no money, there's no jobs, there's no hope for education, there's nothing. They are trapped in a social structure of poverty. They are genuine poor, innocent poor. Now, with the rise of things in, in our economy, with, with single parenting, with, with, with illness, with the costs of, of medical things, people are having their finances broken in the United States as well. And so we have a changing scene, in my opinion, in the United States in terms of poverty right now. The third category I would call troubled prodigals, and that's kind of what I just described, people who are reaping what they've sown. Again, I'm not saying there's no compassion. I'm not saying we don't help. You just recognize the different causes because it takes different sources of help. The heart of God. God's heart for the poor can be seen in Old Testament passages such as these. I'm going to just look at, look at one of them. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 14. I want you to see that God has always, verse 28 and 29 is just the one I'll, I'll, I'll pick up and maybe I'll look at a verse or two just so you can sense it in 15. Israel would tithe every year and bring the tithe to Jerusalem. But every three years, they'd take a second tithe. And that tithe would be, here's what would happen with it. At the end of every third year, you shall bring out all the tithe of your produce in that year and shall deposit it in your town. Ah, not Jerusalem, but at home. The Levite, the one who's doing religious work, because he has no in portion or inheritance among you. The alien, the who? Orphan and the widow who are in your town shall come and eat and be satisfied in order that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand which you do. Now, virtually all of chapter 15 will also talk about ca caring for the poor. You'll, you'll see him say uh, that you will not, you will loan to your brothers. Those who are in need, you will give and you will be generous. Uh, you, you, will not, you will not grow hard or cold as the year of Sabbath, which, which you have to release all debts, comes close and say, well, I'm not going to loan to you because I'd have to forgive you in a year. No, you, you loan generously right on up to the Sabbath year. And he, and he says that, that if we will do that, there'll be virtually no poor among us, that you will care for the poor. Ge verse 10, you'll generously, in chapter 15, give to him, and your heart shall not be grieved, 
And when you give to him because of this thing, the Lord will bless you in all your work and in all your undertakings. For the poor will never cease to be in your land. Where did we hear that before? Jesus. I just read it from Jesus, right? He was quoting there. Will never cease to be in your land. Therefore, I command you, saying, you shall freely open your hand to your brother and to your, to your needy and poor in your land. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. All of this boils down to the heart of love. Last week, we talked about how God wanted us to have chesed, covenant love, promised love, be faithful to, our, to that. Today, we're beginning to see his love for the poor and for the needy. We are to love people just like he does. Go to Isaiah 58. I, you can read some of those other Deuteronomy passages later if you wish. Isaiah 58. Isaiah is going to make a strong point in this chapter. It's one of the great chapters of the Bible. And he's going to say God wants, he wants us to love like he loves. He's not looking for religious people who do a lot, keep a lot of religious observances. That's not the point. And he's going to take on the fast and talk to us about the fast here. Uh, let's pick up at about verse 3. Why have we fasted? The people of Israel asked God. And you do not see. But why have we humbled ourselves and you don't notice? And then the answer is, well, on the day of your fast, you find your own desire. In other words, you're not, you're not fasting for, for me. You're fasting for your, about issues for yourself. You drive hard all your workers. You are harsh in your treatment of your employees. You're abusive to those who are under your care. Behold, you fast for contention and strife and to strike with a wicked fist. You just want, you're asking me to bless you so you can have more power to hurt people. You, you do not fast like you do today to make your voice heard on high. Is it a fast like this which I choose? A day for a man to humble himself? Is it uh, for bowing one's head like a reed? If you go to Israel today, you'll see people pray they, they do this. Just on and on. Bowing your head like a reed. That's what he's talking about. For a spreading out of sackcloth and ashes as a bed. Will you call this a fast, even an acceptable day to the Lord? Now look at verse 6. Is this not the fast which I choose? To loosen the bonds of wickedness? to undo the bands of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free? Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry, and to bring the homeless poor into the house, and when you see the naked, to cover him, and, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh, which means care for your own family members who are impoverished or elderly? He says, do I want you going hungry? Is that the point? Do I want to see you pour out, put out your sackcloth and your ashes and throw it in the air and look really miserable and get really hungry? Is that the point? Well, meanwhile, you're abusing those in your care. Hardly, he says. Don't, I, I'd rather you divided your bread with the poor. I'd rather you were generous and loving and kind and, and, and just. That's what I want from you. I want changed hearts. I want you to love your neighbors yourself. Not just go without food. Isn't that great? Listen to the heart of God. By the way, that is exactly the issue Jesus had with the Pharisees of his day. We're right, we're right at it. We're just, then listen to what God promises, by the way, to those who will be generous and kind and just with the poor. Then your light, that means your revelation, the Holy Spirit will give you divine revelation. Your light will break out like the dawn. Your recovery will spring forth. Your righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. He will protect you divinely by his Shekinah. You will call and the Lord will answer. Anybody find yourself ever wondering why he doesn't answer your prayers? He says, hey, you begin to do this. I'll answer your prayers. You'll cry and he will say, here I am. If you remove the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and the speaking of wickedness, if you give yourself to the hungry, and satisfy the desire of the afflicted. Your light, again, your revelation, will rise in darkness and your gloom will be like midday. I won't go on and read it, but do you see what he says? He'll guide you. He will give you provision. He will give you strength. He will give you growth. You'll be, like, you'll be full of life like, like, like a garden that's well watered. He'll rebuild you and repair you and restore you. Wow. If I do what? 
If I have a heart like him and if I care for the poor and care for the oppressed, if he sees that in me, then I'm the kind of person he will answer my prayers, he will cover me and bless me. Jesus, of course, picks up the same theme. One place where Jesus is teaching on the last judgment, he says the Son of Man will take his throne in that moment of judgment and all the nations of the earth will be brought to him. And then he says he's going to, he's going to say to some, enter into to your king, to the kingdom, you are blessed of the Lord, for when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was poor, you cared for me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in jail, you visited me. When I was sick, you were with me. And, and these will say, many of them will say, Lord, when did we do that? When did we feed you or clothe you or visit you in jail? When did we do these things? And he'll say, insofar as you did it to the least of who? These my brethren. Who is, are his brethren? It is not simply all the poor. It is those who have been abused for their faith in him. It is his disciples and his people who, he, who he's going to say are going to go out and be badly treated. That as they're jailed and as they're, as they're thrown out of their homes and families, as they're, as they're stripped of all of their wealth and finances and left naked, will you love them? And those who do, even though when they don't fully realize what they're doing, will be doing it to Jesus himself. In other words, just as Abraham and Sarah had Yahweh show up at their door, many people have Jesus show up at their door in the poor of his, his people. It's a divine visitation. And he says, you cared for me or you neglected me. What responsibility did the early church feel toward the poor? Well, I give you some passages, and you probably know them well, but let me remind you something. Who wrote the book of Hebrews? I mean, you among all the people of the earth, no. Yes, Barnabas, I think, wrote the book. In chapter 4 of the book of Acts, it's, it's verse 36, it, it says this. It says, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whose name is called Barnabas, the apostles called Barnabas, had a tract of land he sold and came and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. For who? For the poor. I want you to know that the very person that wrote Hebrews is one of the, one of the champions of caring for the poor. So there's just no accident that he has this kind of heart in him. By the way, has it ever occurred to you, what's a Levite doing in Cyprus? Owning land. Could Levites own property in Israel? No. Huh? Can they own land in Cyprus? Oh, yeah. Cyprus is an island, by the way, off the coast of, of, of Israel. Yes, they can. So somebody in his family got the idea going, this landless business is no good. Let's move to Cyprus. And they bought land. When I think Barnabas was part of, of the, day, like the day of Pentecost. He's right in that zone. And so he gets, he gets this, and then he sees all the poor, all the people who are confessing Christ by the thousands, going home and getting a cold reception, and getting thrown out. He goes home and he sells a tract of land and takes and brings the money to the apostles to the care for all their own. It's called koinonia. These are our family. They're our brothers and sisters. They're our eternal brothers and sisters. We must care for them. And so the early church began that. And so you hear him here saying, don't let the love of the brothers erode. Don't stop caring for each other. You must, when, when you are in prison, when you are, when you are beaten and hurt, remember you're in the body, it could happen to you. Love them. Care for them as though you're, they're your own. Practice koinonia. How do we respond here as a church, Northwest Church? Because we've got a clear command to do things. One is our, we do what we call benevolence. Our first priority, we feel, is to care for the believers in need here in our own congregation. We have a benevolence pastor. We have a benevolence council. You give away quite a bit of, of, of assistance to people over the course of the year. We have a food pantry, which 
when we have our own, we'll, we'll, we'll see that they receive from the food pantry. We, but we don't just care for our own. We also care for the poor in general. We, ha we assist the poor outside our congregation by the food pantry. We have 160 families or so a week that are being fed. We have the Tacoma Rescue Mission. Now, I mentioned that some people were prodigals. They'd gotten themselves. They were, there's addictions and drug use and all kinds of difficulties. It's very hard to just give money in those situations. It doesn't help. Many of you have tried. But we've got to help. We can't say, well, you're, you're a mess, so tough. What we have done for at least 15 years here at Northwest, every month you have given money to Tacoma Rescue Mission. Why? They know how. They know how. They know how to help people get off their addictions. They know how to pe get people get jobs. They know how to take them and, and, and help them get all the things they need. So we have been helping people who know better than we. You see? How to really help those in that difficult place. We care for the poor, but we also care for the troubled poor. It's not like you don't care. It's just that you need to do it wisely. We have, we have given as many years to the Home for Unwed Mothers. You have, we help the South Sound Dream Center. You have the youth that do backyard missions. Some of the youth are, are also doing 30-hour famines. The whole point of that is giving, giving food to, the, to uh, people in need. We do missions. We assist people in churches and other locations. Papua New Guinea, Peru, Kazakhstan, our Above and Beyond Fund, you feed 2,000 children a week. You give medical care to 8,000 people in the course of two clinics in a month. You've been providing that for years. You build churches and, house, and you house orphans. You are, with our summer mission, We'll be going this year to Idaho Falls. With our summer mission, we are going to congregations which, frankly, are poorer than we are. They don't have the resources we do. Too much is given, much is required. So it is our joy. We'll take $25,000 and about 50 to 100 or even more people. And when we're done, we will take a, a, a church in other locations. And we will leave about $250,000 to $350,000 in improvement. And value to them. And it's a joy to us. What are we doing? We're going to brothers and sisters who are poorer than we, and we're lifting up their hands. We're strengthening another part of the body. All of that is completely in keeping with God's heart. Do you see that? This is how he wants us to treat each other. Years ago, we made a decision not to build a huge building. We have five acres. But to build out this property and multiply services so we could keep giving to mission, benevolence, and have an adequate staff to support many ministries. It's frankly pretty stressful to have four services over the course of a weekend, particularly on the preacher. <laughs> you watch me trying to gather my thoughts at the beginning of the service. However, to have, to have built a church large enough, we would have to have sold this thing years ago, and I figured at the time to do about $16 million, and it would take a huge mortgage and everything else to do that. We said, let's not. Let's build out what we have, multiple services as much as we can stand, and then just have the money to give away to the poor, to give to missions, and to hire an adequate staff so we have, a, we have a broad base of ministries rather than fire everybody but the few. Now, you have a choice. Do you want a great big building with escalators in your own bowling alley? I mean, that's pretty important. That's how you win the world. Or would you rather give away last year over $600,000, which you did? That's your choice. I think... I think it's fun, given away. I think it's great to go and watch other congregations rise up. And, so, and, and that's what your business council and, and leaders have thought, and that's what the decision this church has made. So it's kind of, you, you say, why are we there? In the situation we're in, I've had people going, why don't you build something bigger? Well, it costs money. And uh, don't you have any faith? No. <laughs> if, if I had faith, we'd have escalators. Come on. 
Now, I'm always conscious this one's going out on the radio. <laughs> to use this building, our facilities team, who is just, are absolutely fabulous, they have tw over 1,200 setups a month. They have to clean and set up a room for a specific event, 1,200 in this building a month. We are wearing this puppy out. And we're fixing it as fast as it breaks. And that's what we're doing. We just decided, let's use this hard. Why? Because God loves the poor. Because God longs for the world. Not, and that we can be, have enough for us and give away more. Our budget right now for our mortgage is 8% of our income. It's very small by comparison. And we've kept it that way on purpose. How does God want us to respond as individual believers? He wants us, you and I, each of us, to identify wasteful or unnecessary spending. He wants us to redline our lifestyle. At what point? You kind of come to a place you say, how much is enough? Because in some people's minds, as long as my income keeps coming, rising, then my lifestyle must keep rising. When I was at Fuller Seminary, we had a professor there named Ralph Winter. And Ralph had come off of the mission field recently when I was there. And, and uh, he and his wife had lived very simply on the mission field. But when he came to, to Fuller, I, I, I need, you need to know that the seminary at that time paid the highest salaries of any seminary in America. And they paid a sizable salary for their, staff, their faculty. They got prestigious people and they paid them. So he went from that to that when he came. And his wife and, and he talked and they said, look, we were perfectly happy on the mission field. So why don't we just live like that in Pasadena? And so they simply kept this, <laughs> the same lifestyle. And I just watched this. He didn't boast on this. I just happened to know he did it and talked. And some people told me what he was doing. But he just, they just said, we lived that way there. Let's live that way here and give everything else to missions. And that man's life just made an impact on me. I couldn't get away from the example of what he had done. It was so different, isn't it, than, uh, you know, never mind. <laughs> and he, and he, I just saw in there that you can redline somewhere. You can just say, this is enough. And that God's not only okay with simplicity, that there's something beautiful about simplicity. You know, we've been in this, we've been in this, just this, this passion in America for, for stuff, and it's driven by an advertising culture. You know what advertising, their job is? To convince you to buy stuff you don't need. That is what advertising, because if you needed it, you don't need to advertise. You don't have the electric company advertising, why don't you turn on the lights? <laughs> you do. But you have other products that they have to sell and have all sorts of, you know, violins going and people just euphoric that they finally are brushing their teeth with this stuff, you know, or... Though I do think you ought to brush your teeth. I think that's a <laughs> standard need, but... But you see what I'm saying? And we've gotten driven in this thing as, as, as really the wealthiest believers on planet Earth. And we've just consumed huge amounts of our own of our own giving, going into debt to live at a lifestyle to find the euphoric happiness that they promise us in the advertising. And it surely hasn't worked. And I'm just saying there's a point where, and it's an individual decision every in people have to make for themselves, where you just say, you know, this is enough. And beyond that, Lord, I just want to, I want to give as you lead me. I want to be generous with it. Watch for those in need. Each of us should be doing that. Persecuted believers, genuine poor, troubled prodigals. We can increase the percentage of our giving as, as we are able. I think as you get older and have fewer expenses, also as, you, uh, as you, uh, your income goes up, there's a point where 10% really isn't enough. You know, where you say, I'm, yeah, I'm tithing, but why don't I give more? Lord, what do you want me to give? And you just begin to increase it as it's there. It's one of the purposes for us for the above and beyond. Many of us want to give more, and that's so we give collectively with it where it's targeted and used well. 
We need to add love and faith to every gift. You know there's plain money and there's blessed money. You can't build God's kingdom with money. You knew that, didn't you? Only people in the spirit can build God's, God's kingdom. But you, when you take money and you say, Lord, by faith and with, in a heart of love, I give this to you and I just get to bless every penny of it and, and, and change lives. That you've released is, is, is an anointing of the spirit. And God, I believe, honors exactly what we've asked. And then finally, we need to get our hands dirty. It's not enough to write a check. You and I need to roll up our sleeves and help people. You need to go on some of these. You need, to, you need to roll up and serve people, not just write a check. There's something profound that happens to us when we are washing feet, when we're caring pe for people with our own hands, getting our hands dirty and loving them. Amen? All right, let's, let's conclude. God is teaching us to love like he loves. Last week we learned he wants us to give promised love like he does. This week we learned he wants us to be compassionate and kind as he is. He wants us to show our thanks to him by actively caring for the poor, especially our brothers and sisters in the family of God. As we do it, as we do, it helps re to remember the plan he has put into place before he made the universe. He predestined us, you and me, to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. You and I are being conformed to Jesus. We are being drawn by the Spirit to love like Jesus loves, to be kind as Jesus is kind, to give and serve as Jesus is. Every one of us is on the same track. It's been predestined before the worlds were made. Aren't you glad? Yes. We are too. You're a lot nicer once Christ works in you. <laughs> and so am I. Would you stand with me? Blessed be the Lord. Father, as we look at your word today, our eyes are opened up again to remember that we are family, not only here at Northwest, but we've got a family around the entire planet, brothers and sisters that are really ours that we're not to forget, that we're not to ignore. It's not their problem. We're in this together. We're in the body. And we ask you, Lord, to just help us as a congregation and help us individually to be faithful stewards of what you've given us, to be generous, to be kind, to find joy in helping the poor, helping the needy, to helping the, the family of God. Oh, Lord God, with our, with our finances, but also rolling up our sleeves and getting our hands dirty and caring for people. Holy Spirit, come. Come. Just draw us deeper. We want to be like Barnabas. What a great man. What a genu generous, kind man. And he's called us to not forget Philadelphia, the love of the brothers. Help us not let that erode. Help us let that be strong and deep in us. We ask that in Jesus' precious name. If that's your prayer, would you say amen? amen? Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.